you have your Bibles, kindly turn with me to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. I, I came across this one story where uh, there were two people who were out on a date. They were just getting to know each other. It was their first date. They were seeing whether they were compatible and whether they could proceed further in their friendship, in their relationship. And uh, the day it started off uh, with this guy deciding to take this girl for a drive to some restaurant, which was a little bit far away. But on the way, his car ran out of fuel. And so both of them ended up hitchhiking to a gas station nearby. And by the time they came back, they realized that the car that they had left that they, that they left because they were stranded without gas was stolen. So it was a really bad uh, start to the date. Then after that, they decided to go to the petrol bunk. They walked back to the petrol bunk. And over there, they called a taxi. They went to a rental company and they rented another car because this guy was really determined to take this uh, girl out for dinner in spite of all those untoward uh, circumstances, the, his car being stolen. He, he said, I'm going to be a man of my word. I said, I'm taking you to dinner, so I'll take you to dinner. Then he... Uh, rents this car, he finally makes it to the restaurant. But sadly, the valet, he goes and bumps the car somewhere and he gives it to him. And on the way back, when he's driving this uh, girl back to her place to drop her off, they get stopped by cops because the valet backed into a pole and the tail lamps broke off. So the cops stopped them and said, you're driving illegally without your tail lamps. So he had to pay that fine over there. Then when, uh, when they reach the house, uh, the girl said, why don't you uh, come inside, I have a cup of tea. So he opened the door, her dog uh, leapt on him and bit him. So then he was rushed to the hospital. Then after after um, they rushed uh, they rushed him to the hospital, this girl also rushed to the emergency. They got him stitched up and everything. Uh, the girl ended up dating the paramedic at the hospital. So all this effort that he put in, you know, for to, to impress this girl was all in vain she ended up dating the paramedic. So that is probably one of the worst dates in history. Begin with that story because, you know, so often today, um, generally the norm is you first maybe get to know, we call it courting or courtship. You first get to know a person. You see if you're compatible. You see if you're a Christian. You see if you're equally yoked. And then... You make a decision, you pray about it, you see if it's God's will for you to be with that person. Then you make a commitment. You see if you love that person, then you make a commitment. But back in the day, especially in biblical times, it was the opposite where the commitment was first made, made the, the marriage was first prearranged, and then they would have fallen in love. And uh, we're going to read a story today, and it's a story about finding a bride for Isaac, that is Abraham's son. This is about finding Rebecca. It starts off by saying in verse 1, now Abraham was old, so he was well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. When I read that verse, I found it interesting because we know, now we've, you know, we know Abraham from chapter 11 of Genesis. That's where we were introduced to him towards the end of chapter 11. And it says, the Lord had blessed him, in all things. But we know he's gone through hardships. We know that at one point, one of his relatives were kidnapped. He had to go with his army of 300 trained soldiers, come servants. He goes and he rescues them. So he's been through so many hardships. He's seen the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember Genesis 22, there was that huge test that he had to uh, pass where God says, after waiting for so many years, you know, the challenge of waiting. And he's finally, when he's 99 years old, Sarah gives birth to Isaac and all those challenges, all those hardships. And then God says, uh, sacrifice him. He, he goes to sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. God stops him just on, when he's on the verge of sacrificing Isaac. So many challenges. And yet in 24, 1, first verse of chapter 24, it says that God had blessed him in all things. And the way I look at it is, you know, when we get to that side of eternity, when we when God pulls the curtains back and we, we, I mean, now we see through a glass dimly, but then we will know for sure, even as we, we will know fully, even as we are fully known. 
And so we might look back at our lives and we might think, oh, so all these things, even those hardships, even those challenges, they were simply blessings in disguise. I mean, we might say, how could this ever be a blessing? But God, who is working all things together, knows why he allows certain things in our life. And that, that's what verse 1 says. He was blessed in everything, in every aspect of his life. Verse 2 goes on. Remember that Abraham has had one son. I mean, he had one, one uh, son through the slave woman, Hagar. That is not the son of promise. That is just the arm of the flesh. He came up with his own plot, his own scheme, and God did not approve of that. So now he has the son of promise, Isaac, and it was through Isaac, God said that your offspring will be named, you will be blessed. And so in verse two, he's, he's, he's going to look for a bride for Isaac. And so Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, he said, put your hand under my thigh. So he speaks to his servant who in this chapter is unnamed, but we're told that he was in charge of the entire household. So a loyal servant, a trusted servant, a man of integrity, probably the senior most servant uh, who has proved faithful over the years. And there's a very good chance the servant is Eliezer, who was mentioned back in Genesis 15, when Abraham thought that he is the one who's going to inherit all his property, all his possessions. He said, uh, he, he thought it was Eliezer when God gave him made the covenant with him, who will, it will pass on to Eliezer. And uh, so it's probably him, even though he's unnamed over here. The word Eliezer means God, the one whom God helps, or God helps, or it means comforter. So it means God helps, the one who God helps, or comforter. And Eliezer is a kind, is a kind of a Holy Spirit. In the sense, he points, he looks forward, just like we have uh, types and because of typology and uh, foreshadowings of Jesus, like Joseph is a type of Jesus and so on. Like that, it is a points to the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit because his name also means comforter. He's the the Holy Spirit is the is God's help to us. He is our helper. He's the paraclete. He's our advocate. He he comforts us. He counsels us. He guides us into all truth. He sanctifies us. And so, Elias is a kind. Of, of of the Holy Spirit. He's a foreshadowing of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Abraham calls him, you know, when I mentioned this, I forgot when I was preaching last week on the rich man and Lazarus, I forgot to mention, I was talking about why I thought it was a parable. And I said it could be either a parable or it could be something that Jesus knew of in actuality, an actual literal historical account. But um, I, was, I was providing a few reasons why I thought it, there's, there's, a, there's a higher chance it's a parable. I was, I was quoting some uh, the parables, the, the beginning, the first line of certain parables in Greek to show you the similarity. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that Lazarus, you know, Jesus names Lazarus over there. That's the main debate. Why does he name a person? And the reason that I think he names Lazarus in that parable because Lazarus is a shortened version of Eliezer, the same person that we're talking about over here, Abraham's most trusted servant, Eliezer, uh, the one who God helps. So Lazarus is just the short form of Eliezer. So the word Lazarus means God helps, the one whom God helps. And I feel like Jesus names him there because he wants to show that the rich man will remain unnamed. He's not, the real, he's not really the important one in that parable. But it's, but it's Lazarus whom God actually helps. Everybody, including the Pharisees, thought, oh, this rich man is so rich. So he's the one, he's the one who, God ha who has God's approval and blessing and favor. But in reality, Lazarus is the one. And that's one of the reasons I think that God, Jesus names him when he tells that, uh, that parable. Anyways, this is probably uh, Eliezer. And so sometimes here and there I might refer to him as Eliezer, because he's Abraham's most trusted, loyal, senior servant. He says, put your hand under my thighs. They didn't have a Bible back in the day to place their hand, or they didn't place it on their heart. They placed it under the thigh. And this is the most rabbis say this should be taken literally. There are some commentators like Adam Clark and others who say this is placing the hand on the loins of the person who, or, or on the mark of the circumcision. Uh, there's no way to tell which one it is. 
the rabbis say it should be taken literally because to sit on somebody's hand is a sign that you submit to their authority. So it could be either of one of uh, either of those things. Uh, so he he says, put your hand under my thigh. He's going to make a covenant. This is how they made. Uh, he, he's going to make a take an oath. He's going to make a promise to his master. And so he he puts his hand under his master's thigh. Now, of course, though, you know when we were young, I remember when I, I think it was in like second standard or so, somewhere around there when we wanted to say something. We used to say something like mother promise and we used to hold our neck or something like this, you know, when you're making a promise. Then later as we grow up, we used to say things like I swear, I swear, those kind of Bible says in James 5.12 that Christians are not to swear by heaven or by earth. And uh, anything, it says let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything additional to that comes from the evil one. Anything additional to that brings condemnation. So James 5.12 says, let our yes be yes and our no be no. So that is New Testament. But this is Old Testament. This is a Hebrew custom. He says, make an oath to me. And so now let me read verses 3 to 9. Uh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son, Isaac. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me back to this land from which you came. Abraham said to him, see to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this, this matter. So um, A Abraham is very particular that while finding a mate, while finding a partner, a spouse for his son Isaac, that the, that the servant goes back to Ur of the Chaldeans to find a suitable partner for his son Isaac. He doesn't want, uh, it's, it's not a racial issue, it's, it's more of a spiritual one. It's a, he doesn't want a wife from the Canaanites because the Canaanites are unbelievers. They had abominable customs, abominable practice practices, and so he doesn't want he doesn't want uh, the servant to find the wife from the the place where he was dwelling, the promised land. He wants him to go back to his hometown and find somebody from there. That way, that's the best that he can do. And this reminds us of a principle that's more fully developed in the New Testament. I think Second Corinthians six fourteen. The Apostle, uh, Apostle Paul says, don't be unequally yoked. And the context is slightly different there. But the principle still applies to us as believers today. When we're looking for a partner, we're looking for a spouse. I don't think, I think most people on this, uh, this, this particular Bible study is not looking for a spouse. But even when this recording is heard later, if you're somebody who's looking for a potential spouse, Bible is very clear about not being unequally yoked. Imagine having an ox on one side and like something like a goat on the other side, or two 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 oxes pulling going in different directions, different trajectories. To be counterproductive, the work won't get done. It'll be chaos and confusion, and so that's why Paul says, "Don't be unequally yoked." And we see that over here in its nascent form, in its budding form, where Abraham says, "Go back to my hometown, find a wife." for Isaac from there. And they, see, he, he's saying, go back to his hometown. Again, he's not compromising because God called him out of his hometown. So he says, go back to the hometown, but bring her back here. He doesn't want Isaac to go there. And, and he says, he's so serious about these instructions that he says, if he's not able to accomplish these two things, not able to find a wife there, or she doesn't come back, 
He says, you're no more under this oath. So here is a man who's really grown in his faith over the years. There's no compromises. There's no negotiating. There's no bargaining. Like if, if she's not coming, okay, fine, take Isaac and get her married. Let him shift back. Let him move back to Ur, where I first came from. He wants Isaac to dwell in the land of promise, the land that was promised to him by God, because God said your descendants would be multiplied through Isaac and through his wife. He wants him to come back and live in the land that God promised him, but he wants a wife from his own hometown. And so we see a man who has matured in his faith now, who's grown through all those challenges. Let me read a couple more verses. We can't really drill down on every verse because the chapter is quite long and we have to move on. And even as I read, you will find, you. I hope, that uh, you will pay uh, careful attention to the narrative and then share some of the thoughts, some of the things that spoke to you from this, this uh, chapter, Genesis 24. Let me read from verses 10. Let me just read one verse for now. Let me read one verse. Verse 10 says, Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. That, that's where Abraham was. The city of Nahor is basically Abraham's grandfather's name was Nahor. Abraham's brother's name was Nahor. And in that sense, in both those senses, it was the city of Nahor. So he comes from an influential family. Uh, it's in the region of Mesopotamia. The servant takes all the, the master's camels. We know that Abraham's a very wealthy man, one of the most wealthiest man during his uh, wealthiest men during his time so he takes these camels full of gifts from his master so laden with gifts he sets out so now here it's that the, the question of dowry uh, arises over here back in the day the the boy's side used to take uh, dowry or some gifts for the girl's side to show that they're capable of providing for the bride now, especially in countries like India and all the other countries that still practice dowry like Sri Lanka, Nepal, and uh, uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan, some African countries as well. These, these are the countries that still uh, have the practice of dowry. It's kind of, it's more or less inverted now. It, it's, it's become opposite where the bride is expected to give something to the groom's side. Uh, and uh, so I was just reading a little bit about this. And, uh, and now, if it is a free will, if it is a free will gift, there's nothing wrong with it. if somebody wants to bless some somebody. There's nothing wrong with it. if somebody wants to say, "Oh, this is my custom, so I would like to give you something," and they do it of their own volition or of their own free will. Nothing wrong with blessing somebody, blessing another party, whether it's coming from the boy's side or the girl's side. But when there is coercion, then it is wrong. It is unchrist. Like when when dowry is expected from the boy's side. And um, that is the, you know, it's like an expectation and people are pressurizing that is unchristlike and it is not godly. And, and so, you know, dowry, dowry was outlawed in 1961, but we know that it still happens all the time. And uh, in 2022, according to statistics in India, there are 6,000 dowry related suicides. So the number slightly dropped from 2014, where it was about 8,000. So the situation is slightly improving, but um, there's, a, there's a lot of deaths. According to the National Crime Bureau, every one hour there's a dowry related death. So there are a lot of these women, if you just Google it and look at all the news articles I saw about two, three today, it's a, uh, about uh, regarding dowry deaths where people are pressurized and it's a, they're asking for property and uh, a lot of money and cash and kind all those things. So some women feel very pressurized, which leads them, which causes them to commit suicide. And so here are two, three questions. One is one is covert and two are overt. One is very obvious when it comes to this whole dowry and whether uh, it is dowry, whether we have the right motives when a marriage is being talked about, when it's being arranged, when it's there in its preliminary stages. The first thing is we have to ask is money a deciding factor in the marriage? Because if money is a deciding factor in the marriage and it's, it's only based on whether the girl's party, because that's how dowry is today, right? It comes from the girls. If money is the deciding factor which finalizes the marriage, then as Christians, we're doing wrong there. It, should, it goes much beyond that, you know, like whether they're able to provide, give dowry or not. The second thing, which is more, more covert, is that 
did the boy, his relatives, his parents approach, attempt to find out how well off the, the girl is, or what are the resources of her family, how much inheritance she has, how much property. And they're doing all this investigation to find out. Again, this is they're not directly asking, but they're trying to do all this. Again, it shows wrong motives and shows a spirit of covetousness and is wrong. That That's not how we should go about these things. And then again, you know, another very covert way is uh, do you secretly, I mean, the person who's getting married or the parents of the person giving their son in marriage, do they secretly hope? Is there this hope, uh, hope within, within them, a secret hope? I hope they'll give me something. I hope they'll give my son some gift because all these things point and show that the motives are not right because ultimately there is one condition and you know i'd like to gently remind everybody and everybody even who listens to this in the future that there is only one condition that the bible prescribes and that is to marry in in the lord everything else is secondary to that yes it's it's important to know what that person is doing supposing the boy is jobless and he's a lazy guy. All those things are important to find out a little bit about the boy's past, the girl's past. All those things are important. Are they good Christians? So number one requirement is that they both should be believers. You shouldn't make the, the your partner, your potential partner, say that he is your mission field and your project and you know, it's okay to get married. He'll get converted and thing. Of course, once if you got married as normal Christians or unbelievers and one of you change, that's a totally different story. But if both of you are still unmarried, then the first condition according to the Bible should be that both of you are believers. I remember this one preacher telling the story about how, um, you know, he, he has a quite a large church. He has a couple of pastors. So he was telling the story of how uh, this couple came to him for pre-counseling on Friday evening, just, just the last final session. He thought that they had already been mentored. They'd been through the course. They were ready for marriage because he was going to um, uh, marry them the very next day. So on Friday evening, they came to him for premarital counseling. They, they were going to be married on Saturday. So they come to him. And so he just started asking some general questions. He said, so where are you all spiritually? And he could see that they, they became visibly uncomfortable. And then he said, do you all read the Bible? Do you all pray together? And, and the guy just sort of like slumped in his chair, but the girl was getting a little bit defensive. And she said, at one point she said, that's not your, that's none of your business to the pastor. And he said, I'm a pastor. This is what I do. This is what I ask. I have to find out these things. And um, he kept asking, he, he pressed a little bit uh deeper he, he he started asking more pressing questions he said do you do you even read the bible do you all pray together and then at one point she just got angry she got up and she left the room so the pastor told this guy that you have about two three hours today to get her back we can sit and talk sort this out figure out how we're going to proceed if you want to get married tomorrow you'll have to make a serious commitment but uh, that guy never came back so probably he went and talked to that girl and they said, we don't want to be getting married if he's going to be digging into our personal spiritual lives. And so they, they didn't come back and the pastor never married them. Sadly, just a, just a few years later, the pastor found out that they, they both were divorced. So, so it's really important that we find a person who is a strong believer. That's not to say they'll be perfect and we, you know, we should have these expectations that are absolutely unreal somebody who truly loves the Lord and seeks to follow the Lord. That is the most important condition for uh, marriage because, you know, there was a study that found out 40% of teenagers said they're willing to marry an unbeliever and 25% said they, they will consider marrying an un unbeliever. But that's, that's extremely, that's an extremely unwise place to start off from because then you're adding to a lot of complications simply uh, going against what the Bible prescribed. So well, let me read now verses 13 to 13 and 14. One second. So he goes, he goes to the city of Nahor and verse 11 says, yeah, verses 11 to 14, I'll read. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, 
God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. So this, this servant who is who we have already established and most probably Eliezer travels somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 kilometers. Now, if, if you go, go in a straight line as the crow flies, it's about 800 kilometers. But if you go past all the rivers and all the rest stops and everything where you have to water the camels, give them food, all the rest stops, it's about somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 kilometers, which is a very long journey back in the day, probably took somewhere close to a month. So he's going with all these camels, all these goods. He finally reaches the, the city or the town of Nahor, and he makes all the camels kneel kneel down. And immediately, he, he's a man of God. Immediately, he prays. And he says, the God of my master, Abraham, please grant me success today. And, and he, he, he sort of comes up with this condition through which he will know whether that is the girl that God is giving to, 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 his, to his master's son, Isaac. And the condition is, he will ask for water. And if she says drink and then offers to water his camels, that will be the girl that God is God is showing them. And so that, that that's the condition that he has. He prays about it. Now, now this this prayer that he prays prays is quite unusual because it's a prayer that is that is answered even before he finishes. As he's finishing, it's already answered. And that reminds us of a verse in Isaiah 65, I think. Give me one second, Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah 65, which says that even before you call, I will answer. So, you know, many times we talk about God keeping us waiting. And yes, there are seasons of waiting, but he's also a God who can do things instantly and immediately. And he can answer us even before we call. He's, he, he, he speaks even, before, even as, um, or rather he hears even as we're speaking. So he, he's a God, even in, in the book of Mark and other gospels, he's the, he's the immediate savior. So he's not only, sometimes, yes, if it's for our good, he keeps us waiting and that waiting shapes us, but he's also a God who can do things instantly and who can speed up the process. So over here, even before Eliezer finishes praying, the prayer is answered. And that verse that I was quoting was Isaiah 65, 24, before they call, I will answer. So <clears throat> verses uh 15 to 21 now before he had finished speaking before he had finished praying behold rebecca who was born to bethuel the son of milka the wife of nahor abraham's brother came out with her water jar on her shoulder the young woman was very attractive in appearance a maid in whom no man had known she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up then the servant ran to meet her and said please give me a little water to drink from your jar and he's probably praying now, I hope, I hope the other thing also comes to pass. Yeah, he, he's going to ask for the water, but then he's going to wait to see if she offers to water the camels. She said, drink, my Lord. And this is L and Lord is small L. So it's just a term of respect. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. You can probably can imagine how happy Eliezer is, this loyal servant is, because exactly what he prayed about, that sign that he asked for, now is coming to pass. And she's saying, I'll also water your camels. Now, he could have gone there. He could have parked all his camels over there and said, I'm going to look for the most attractive, the most beautiful woman. But you see, his condition was not most beautiful, most attractive woman, although we're told she was. His, his The way he looked out for her, he, he was searching for a lady with an industrious spirit or a, or a servant heart or somebody who was interested in serving. And that's why he said the one who says, one who offers to water the camels, which is not an easy job because he was there with 10 camels. They were probably very thirsty and each camel would have required about 20 gallons of water. That is about 
yeah the, the you know i read somewhere that a camel when it's thirsty can drink 200 liters of water in 3 minutes we struggle sometimes to drink 1 liter of water but camel can drink 200 liters of water in just 3 minutes so imagine if she offers to water the camel it's not like just she'll give one teacup of water she has to bring barrels and barrels of water she has to keep going back and probably take something like one hour and hour, an hour and a half you know, and it's intensive labor. So that proves to him, that proves to Eliezer that this is a girl who's interested in serving and she's showing her servant heart and that she's somebody who cares, somebody who's affectionate, somebody who's sensitive to this traveler's need. And uh, so she is hospitable and she says, I will also water the camel. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and uh, ran again to the well to draw water and she drew for all his camels. The man, that is Eliezer, gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey. The reason why verse 21 is there, I think is because he is standing and gazing, he is standing and looking at her to see if she's actually going to do what she says. Because some are sweet talkers. They'll say, oh, we'll do this. They might quit halfway and leave. Or they might water one or two camels and then say, sorry, I can't do the rest. Or they might say, I'm busy and go. We're standing to see if she's actually a woman of her word, a lady of her word. You know, I was just last Saturday, I was talking to the youth about uh, Ruth, the book of Ruth. And that, that very emotional part where Naomi says to uh, her daughters-in-law, she says, go back to, to the land of Moab. You know, I can't have children. How oh, yes, if even if I have children, you're going to wait for them to grow up and then marry them. So just go back. So Orpa says, okay. She 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 kisses her mother-in-law and she returns. First she said no, but then she says, okay, I'll go back. You know what you say. What you say is logical, makes sense, reasonable, and she heads back to the land of Moab. But Ruth continues, as we all know, and you know that famous dialogue where you go, I'll go. Your people, my people. Your God, my God. Until you die, I'll be with you. So somebody preached, one preacher preached a sermon called Kissers and Cleavers. So there are some people, I like that title because there are some people who will kiss and they'll smooth talk and they'll, you know, they do all the right things. They say all the right things, but they, where it really matters, where the rubber really meets the road, they, they don't show up. They don't show their affection. They don't share their care. There's no hard work. So what, the, the reason I brought that up is because here in verse 21, we're told man gazed at her servant gazed at her to see if she was a woman of her she whether she'd actually do what she said she would do or she was just you know offering to do something but then would quit later so verses 22 to 28 like i said it's a fairly long chapter and we that, that's the reason we're not going too deep into any of the verses because we have to keep moving on verses 22 when the camels had finished drinking the man took a gold ring. Now he, now he's hopeful. Now he's seen the sign of God. Well, his prayer is coming to pass. He takes a gold ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing 10 gold shekels, uh, which again points to the fact that Abraham is a very wealthy man and a very generous man and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder in the room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in this way to the house of my master's kinsmen. Then the young woman ran and told her mother, mother's household about these things so uh yes we see the generosity of abraham and also in verse 27 there's there's an important principle where where when the when the when he gives her these gifts she obviously she must be excited now he prays and he says blessed be the god of abraham towards the end of verse 27 he says as for me the Lord has led me in the way, some translations say on the way, in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. The important principle is this, that sometimes, you know, when we're seeking direction, when we're seeking God's will, we must start, we must set out and God will guide accordingly. We, we must do what we know to do and God, you know, where we need direction, he'll provide the wisdom, the guidance, 
the wherewithal for us to carry on. He'll give us the strength to carry on. In other words, somebody talked about this principle, very simple principle to understand. It's easier to steer a moving object than it is to steer a stationary one. When it's moving, there's momentum. It's easier to guide that person or that moving object or a car. It's easier to steer a, a car when it's moving than when it's stationary and change the trajectory accordingly. So even with God, it, the, the principle is the same way. When, once you start, God will guide and, uh, you know, you, you take, it's God who ordains our steps, but we must start, we must uh, begin. We can't just sit back. A Abraham wasn't sitting back in his tent saying, Lord, uh, Isaac needs a wife. I'll just wait on you and you send me some girl miraculously. He takes affirmative action. He's proactive about it. He asks his servant, delegates the responsibility to his most loyal servant. And so the servant sets out who you know follows his master's instruction it was a general instruction go, go back i mean it was specific in some sense he said you should not uh, you should bring a girl from or and you cannot take my son there she must come she must be willing to come here if she hasn't you're free from the oath but or is a big there are many ladies over there and even to this guy he sparked all the camels he's waiting all the men's daughters would come out but he prays he goes step by step and step by step god reveals the next plan of action god reveals his will for them and and there are other examples of this in scripture as well one would be when philip in acts chapter 8 he god says go to the desert but after that he doesn't tell him what to do in the desert when he reaches the desert he says now go and run along with that chariot and that's where he finds the eunuch and he's reading isaiah and he explains it to him he's baptized there immediately so often god works like that and that's how we we we, we start with affirmative action we step out in faith and then God guides us unless he says wait. Like, for example, the disciples, Jesus told the disciples to wait in the upper room until they're empowered and clothed with power from on high until they receive the Holy Spirit. Then they can go out and carry out the great commission. So unless there's some specific instruction like that from God where he says, wait, don't go wait in that place for further instruction. We ought to do use our common uh, sanctified common sense and do what we believe God expects of us, what he's called us to do, and he will guide along. That's how his providence works. That's how it works. We shouldn't, we shouldn't over-sensationalize over -sensationalize the way God works and say, if you want me to do, just give, you know, shake the, or you know, cause an earthquake or show me this. We just start, we set out in faith, and we will see his providence. He will bring out a supernatural outcome through very natural daily circumstances. So <clears throat> the principle in all this, especially in verse 27, is God's providence is seen in man's diligence. God's providence is seen in man's diligence. When he uses a sanctified common sense, God comes along and he guides him. You know, a simple example of that would be if I have to prepare a sermon, I can't just come on Sunday morning and say, God, you're supernatural, so why don't you just, you know, help me to download the sermon directly from heaven and let me speak to the people i have to be diligent to prepare during the week and it is in that preparation it's in that hard work that is put in labor the toil that god will show give revelation i don't know who it was i think it's aw pink or one of those great men of god who said that um, no scripture yields its meaning to a lazy person. So you can't just sit there, expect the meaning to come in some sermon and illustrations to just all fall into place and suddenly out of nowhere is born this well-crafted sermon. You have to put in the word. The more harder you work, the more revelation God will use. And it's the same principle. The more, the, the, when we set out using our common sense, common sense, God guides us through the power of his spirit. So re moving on, verse, verse tw tw 28 it says the, the, the young woman ran and told her mother's house. She's very open. She's very excited. She goes and she shares everything. Verse 29, let me read. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. And this is, we have to keep our eyes on Laban because he's a shrewd guy. He'll appear later in the book of Genesis. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. And as soon as he saw the ring and the bracelet on his sister's arms and heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, thus the man spoke to me. He went to the man and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, come in, O, o blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw to straw and fodder to the camels. And there was water to wash his feet and, and the feet of men who were with him. 
when food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. And he said, speak on. So you have Laban over here who's a very shrewd guy, uh, cunning at times. Um, surprisingly, he's the one who takes charge. There is, she is actually Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca's father is Beth uh, Bethuel, but uh, kind of uh, plays a secondary role. He, he does give his approval later. But somehow they had entrusted the main role to the brother Laban over here. Maybe he had proved how what a shrewd businessman he was. And he sees all these gifts. Laban does. He sees all these gifts and he's think he must be thinking, what's in it for me? Maybe my entire family can benefit from this very wealthy person uh, whose servant has now appeared uh, into our lives and he has this proposal. So he 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 he's very hospitable. He says, Come, I you know I've prepared food for you, I will take care of the camels. Um, so, but, but the servant means business and he won, he first things first, he's there on a mission and his priority is to find, to first figure out whether they're on board with the entire thing. The reason, the very reason he's come there. So he says, first I have to say what I have to say. And then accordingly, you know, and that's good. It's good that he did not eat and then, you know, spring a very, spring a surprise on them and they were not happy with why, why he came. The first he says, let's deal with why I'm actually here, the real purpose. So he said, verse 34, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him, he has given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from my daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me, but he said to me, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son and from my clan and from my father's house. Then you will be a then you will be free from my oath when you come to my clan. And if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and I said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of the water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink. And, and who will say to me, drink? And I will draw from your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebecca came out with a water jar on her shoulder and she went down to the spring and drew water. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camels drink, camels drink also. So I drank. And she gave the camels drink also. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, who Milka bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. And then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or the left. So, needless to say, he's quite verbose. He, but I, I appreciate the, the, the servant because he's a man of integrity. If you notice, he's not left out a single detail. He's very open about everything. And if you count the number of times he says, my master, my master, you know, every time he refers to his master, Abraham, so it's about 22 times. He's such a loyal servant. He's such a good, he's basically a messenger carrying out the mission that he's been entrusted with. And so, you know, he, he's, he's being really open about everything, nothing, not, he's not leaving anything out. He's talking, he's even being open about what his master says. And again, this is also an important principle is that even when it comes to marriage or fi finding a spouse that we must be open and uh, we must not have skeletons in the closet and, um, you know, hide certain things. Everything must be out in the open. Everything must be uh, discussed. And so he tells everything. He says how he came to find her and all those things. And this reminds us that we're also messengers to our master today. And just, just three, four important lessons that we learn from what Eliezer did well here as he represented 
his master, as he was trying to carry out this task, this mission that his master gave him. We also have a mission. The first thing that Eliezer did is he said, my master is great. God has blessed him abundantly and he names all the donkeys, camel servants, all that. He says in verse 35, my master has been blessed by God and he is great. That We ought to do that as well. We need to talk about our great master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says in verse 36, he says, he has an heir, he has a son, and his heir is going to receive everything. He's referring to Isaac now. And the same way in Colossians 1.16, talks about Jesus. And it says all things were created, not only by him, it's created for him and through him. And then again, Hebrews 1.2 says the same thing. Hebrews 1.1 says that in, in the former days, God spoke to the God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets various times in 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 many, in, in various ways. But now he has spoken finally uh, finally fully through his son, uh, and his son is the heir of all things through whom he also made the universe. So Jesus is the heir, and do we tell people about it? Because in Jesus we also benefit a lot of things, and we've been through all that in the book of Romans. So then he also says in verses thirty nine to forty one, one of the expectations is that this person should leave, that is, now we find out it's Rebecca, should leave her old home and come to live with the master. We should leave our old life, our life of sin, the, the life where we were living according to the ways of the world, according to our flesh, according to the devil's plan for our life. We leave all that, leave the old life, leave the flesh, crucify the flesh, and come to live with the master in the master's house surrender our lives to him so this, this is what we should do even as we evangelize we tell we talk about how great god is we talk about the fact that uh, god the father has an heir and jesus inherits everything everything belongs to jesus everything was made by him through him for him and then finally fourthly he sought a definite answer in verses 49 if you notice that long section that i just read and again thank you for your patience and listening uh, to this study verse 49 he says now then if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master tell me and if not tell me that i may turn to the right or turn to the left and leave so he's pressing them for an answer and that's what we should do you know some people they just beat around the bush share some some something from the gospel and if their person shows interest they might just inflate the numbers and say ten thousand people accepted christ today and so many people were baptized it's all about numbers but we need to press them for an answer. It's biblical to press them for an answer and ask them, so are you going to make a serious commitment to God? When we evangelize, when we talk about our Savior, the Lord Jesus, we, we can't just uh, say this is what Jesus did in my life and then leave it all open. And we need to find out whether they are serious about making a commitment and and, and seek a definite answer, basically. So, let me, so that's just basically a summary of these verses and some of the lessons that we can learn from them. Let me read verses 50 onwards. So once he may, he uh, he tells them the reason that he's there, he spills it all out. Then Laban, and, and Laban's name first year, like I mentioned earlier, he, he's kind of in charge of things. Bethuel is there, the father is there, but Laban is the one who is really in charge. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing has come from the Lord. Maybe Bethuel was really old and he was deteriorating at this stage. The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. So they've heard this. They saw how God worked. They're impressed. They're assured that this is the Lord's doing. There's no question. There's no doubt about it. And they say, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. See, uh, how many points he's praying when he comes there, everything. And that's why prayer also, you know, through, even, even as we read this chapter, even if it comes tomorrow and somebody who is single is listening, this prayer is also very important. Even if you're going to date a person, you're quoting a person, one of the, the ways to break the ice is to ask that person, will you pray with me? Because when you pray with that person, if they if they if they say no, what I am not somebody who prays and all, I'm, I don't believe. You should end that then and there. If there's somebody who you can pray with, even when you're quoting them before your marriage, if you pray together and not just on the first date, but when you pray subsequently, that that's that's a very healthy sign. That's a very good sign. And of course, out of the abundance, just through their prayer life and just through the things they're saying, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You'll be able to gauge whether this person is in the Lord. Or they're a fraud, are they just pretending? And uh, you will be unpleasantly surprised later after you tie the knot. So prayer is a very important thing for 
couples to do even pre pre marriage and they're just getting to know each other to see if they're going to carry carry things uh, on into the future so <clears throat> so uh, th- this servant over here as he's working on behalf of uh, Abraham he continues to pray even now he 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 bows down he 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 prays He bowed himself before the earth and the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave her brother and her mother costly ornaments and he had taken the men who were with him and he and the men who were with him ate and drank and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Her brother and mother said, let the young woman remain with us a while, at least 10 days after that she may go. But he said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent Rebecca away, their sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. And we know that that came true. It was, uh, she was blessed, and Isaac and Rebekah were blessed. But um, just a couple of points over here. You know, I think it was Donald Gray Barnhouse who uses this passage over here when, when they, they, you know, when they, after they, have dinner and they have some good fellowship and they're resting and talking and having fun the next morning maybe it was a little emotional for the for the brother and for the mother and they said you know don't take her away so fast let her stay here with us for another 10 days but the servant doesn't want to delay unless something changes something goes wrong he you know he got his prospered and brought him so far he doesn't want to delay any further and it was donald gray barnhouse who said Sometimes when we surrender to Christ, when we're going to go to the master's house, the world will say, stay back, stay, stay 10 more days. They might applaud your devotion, but they will ask you, they will try and delay you and say, just don't, 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 don't surrender wholeheartedly yet. Or, you know, one leg here, one leg there. Don't, let it not be. They, they try to delay your exit. That is the exit from the world. Leave your old ways, your old life behind. And they want to keep you as long as possible and say, yeah, you can go eventually. And sometimes we fool ourselves like that as well, where we say that uh, I can be here a little bit longer, but uh, delayed obedience, as I said many times, somebody said it, but I like it. Delayed obedience is disobedience and God doesn't appreciate procrastination. And so the servant is on a mission. He's focused and he says, don't delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go. My mass and the implication is with with Rebecca and whoever needs to come with her. So again, one more point. They, it is a prearranged marriage or what we call as arranged marriage. Here, you know, she just comes looking for a spouse. Rebecca is the one he prays. He's happy. God is given his signs of confirmation. He's ready. They they ask Rebecca. She goes. But they also when 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 her family says, "Let us stay back," he says, "No, I need to go." They say, let's ask her as well. So it's not like she was just pushed into it and they, he came, uh, you know, the, he, he just takes Rebecca and goes. They asked her, they asked her over here whether she wants to go. And she says, just, you know, that, that, that again, God's, it's, it's her response saying, I will go immediately is a sign that God's hand is on this entire thing. You know, her devotion and her, just her, sense of urgency where she doesn't want to she doesn't want to delay she knows now her new allegiance is going to be towards her new family first and so she leaves she says i will go and they're on their way verses 61 to 67 and that's the end of the chapter so it has 67 verses and we're almost done here then rebecca and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man thus the servant took rebecca and went his way now isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. She so she took her veil and she covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her, 
So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So it's a beautiful ending to this story where Abraham sends the servant out on a mission. The mission is successful. The bride has been brought to the house and Isaac gets married. And it also says that he was comforted after his mother's death, after his mother's um, uh, loss. So I'm sure during the whole journey, even Rebecca must have been talking to Eliezer saying, tell me about Abraham, tell me about uh, my new husband. Is he like this? Is he like that? Tell me about the family. And she'd have uh, acquainted herself with all their ways and customs and all that. So it's a beautiful story, long chapter, many lessons. We couldn't cover all of them, but we covered some of them. I'm interested now to hear what are your thoughts on any any section of uh, this passage. If you, anything spoke to you, please feel free to, to unmute and talk. But uh, on my part, that is Genesis chapter 24, 1 to 67. 